everyone. Thank you for the invitation to share this video. I look forward to speaking with you next week. My name is Ian Alexander. As part of the Engaged Humanities Network, I hope to put together a collection of writing and artwork theorizing and challenging prison censorship. I study prison history, prisoners' movements, and histories of media and technology. There are a lot of ways to understand the relationship between prisons and media. We can think about media representations of prisons, for instance. Films, TV shows, crime novels, news reports, social media, radio programs, and just about any medium you can think of is full of a huge range of these. But I'm focused on media technologies in prisons, particularly as sites of struggle between prisoners and prison guards, prison administrations, and prison companies, like those that control mail, phones, and digital tablets. I argue that prisons are media systems, and their operation can only be fully understood if we take media and media technologies into account. In my book, I look at the ways that prisons use media technology to control and isolate prisoners, and to stifle prison organizing and make basic acts of solidarity difficult and dangerous. For instance, take the prison telephone, which is really the prison payphone. It's a mainstay in movies and TV shows about prisons. Before the early 1970s, most prisoners had little or no access to phones. After the widespread uprisings, hunger strikes, and work stoppages across U.S. prisons and jails in the 70s, we start to see phone installation. More connection is an objectively good thing for everyone locked up, and for everyone with a loved one locked up. But imprisoned people in the 60s and 70s were demanding more in-person visits, and they were demanding that, if they were to remain incarcerated, they should be closer to home. Attica, for example, is a day's drive from New York City, while Sing Sing is nearly a day's drive from Syracuse. Instead of in-person visits with family, people in prisons got tinny-sounding, surveilled, expensive phones. Here's a piece by imprisoned artist Xavier XO Clay depicting the multi-purpose prison payphone as an instrument of theft, surveillance, and pacification. What's worse, as the late imprisoned black radical intellectual Russell Maroon Schultz argued, is that only the so-called good prisoners gained access to new media technologies. The rest, who were deemed dangerous or rebellious, were buried in solitary confinement, control units, and eventually supermaxes. The phone, as a necessary form of connection, therefore became leverage, a precious thing that can be taken away for any reason at any time. On the other side of this struggle, prisoners have always used whatever has been available to them to build solidarity networks, prisoners' organizations, and community. They have made newspapers and cells. Radio receivers have been repurposed as radio transmitters. In 2020, prison TikTok videos went viral. They featured scenes of prison life that are rarely seen on the outside, choreographed dances, unconventional cooking, and many exposés about prison's conditions. In my research, I have developed the concept of the carceral media regime to make sense of the complex and always evolving systems of mediation in prisons and jails. Throughout my research, I've spoken with a number of imprisoned organizers about how they use media technology in their organizing and activism. Some have recorded podcasts from inside using the prison phone, getting their analysis and their voice out into the world without needing the content to be approved by prison officials. Others have taken prison digital tablets, which are, as you can imagine, intensely limited in their functionality, and hacked them to make internet access possible. A simple thing like access to WhatsApp can make all the difference to someone who's locked up. Netflix streaming is a godsend to someone experiencing the unimaginable boredom and slowness of prison life. But a hacked tablet can also store PDFs of radical texts from liberation movements, providing a basis for study groups. So you can already see how censorship is absolutely central to all of this. So the title of my proposed project comes from imprisoned intellectual Marilyn Buck, uh, The Prison is Censorship. I have conceived of it in three parts. One section where imprisoned intellectuals and activists theorize prison censorship and its effects. One section about overcoming and working around the prison censorship regime as activists and researchers imprisoned and in the so-called free world. And one section presenting rich examples of a range of texts and visual artwork to give a shape of some of what exactly is censored. It's a project that is at once a collection of works in the public humanities, as well as a guide to facilitating and producing more public humanities work in the specific conditions created by prisons. I envision the project as offering a critique of the notion of public, which needs to be expanded to confront the problem of prison censorship as an ongoing project. Incarcerated audiences and, more importantly, incarcerated producers of humanistic and social scientific knowledge about a range of topics, not only prisons, are systematically cut out from most articulations of the public. 
for thinking about this problem of the public and prison publics, and more importantly, what to do about it. I love the word engaged in the Engaged Humanities Network. We can think of prisons as systematically, forcibly disengaged publics. Reaching people behind the wall requires more than choosing a free platform over a paywalled one, and it certainly requires more than sharing outside perspectives in a one-dimensional patronizing relationship. Any work about prisons claiming to be public, and work that claims imprison people as part of the group it calls the public, needs to go beyond writing, speaking, publishing, and media making only. It requires engaging in dialogue and building trust. And engaging in dialogue with imprisoned people, especially dialogue that is political, anti-racist, anti-patriarchal, anti-colonial, anti-carceral, and or anti-capitalist, requires us on the outside to engage in struggle against prison censorship. That censorship regime works in ways that are both passive and active. Passive forms include the simple fact that people in prisons rarely have access to booksellers and rarely have disposable money for books. They're not as likely to be trained and conditioned to read and write in the same styles that academic and even journalistic writers use, uh, styles that are all intensely racialized, gendered, and which have class character. Uh, we can challenge these forms of censorship by sending in materials, fundraising for books, and encouraging presses and news outlets, as well as other publishers, to do the same. We can engage with real imprisoned people directly and study together and help them form study groups among themselves. Some of the active forms of censorship are those that are more recognizable as censorship in the classic sense. Books and letters get returned to sender. Cells are raided and reading materials are destroyed. Prisoners who speak out are punished. Prisoners who form study groups are disbanded and punished. And certain texts and publications are banned at the institutional uh, or facility level or at the level of the state. Perhaps the most important one is that internet access, which we have taken for granted on the outside for about three decades, is totally forbidden. The fact that universal internet and cell phone bans in prisons and jails are taken for granted speaks to the depth and power of this prison censorship regime. A lot of what I have learned about prisons, prison media, and prison censorship, I have learned through my participation in prison media projects. The project I've spent the most effort on um, and that I put the most time into has been a journal that I started in 2020 with a good friend named Stevie Wilson. Stevie is a black queer radical intellectual who was imprisoned in Pennsylvania. Over the course of our friendship, we had kicked around the idea of starting up an abolitionist journal, primarily by and for incarcerated people. We thought of it as a kind of forum where outside supporters like me could do the logistical work that people in lockup can't do, like open a P.O. box, receive mail, transcribe submissions, format text and images, fundraise on social media, and finally order printed journals, put them in envelopes, address them, stamp them, and send them off, and then, of course, deal with censorship rejections. We had to learn everything together, the small group of us who started and worked on this project over the years. But we made some beautiful issues and built a list of over uh, 400 in-prison subscribers who never had to pay a cent. Because reading material gets shared and passed around a lot more in prison, we likely reached many more readers than just our 400 person subscriber list. We get to circulate ideas and facilitate discussion between people locked up thousands of miles apart or even in the same facility Either way, people who couldn't just hop on a call or get coffee together. New writers got up their confidence and published in the journal for the first time. And three of these imprisoned intellectuals who published for the first time in the journal are now editors in the project, helping other writers uh, build up their own confidence and publish for their first time. And they have taken the project in a new direction and it is set to become a, uh, a magazine in, in 2024. This experience is what really drives the censorship project. With this project, I hope to, with this new censorship project that I'm proposing, I hope to help consolidate some of the dispersed knowledge that imprisoned and non-imprisoned activists, organizers, and researchers have accumulated. The hope is that people who want to engage imprisoned intellectuals in community and who want to engage the prison regime in struggle won't have to start from scratch. Because this is clearly not a one-person project, I'm excited about the prospect of doing this work as part of the Engaged Communities Program. I look forward to learning from others at Syracuse and in Syracuse, and I know that each city in the U.S. experiences incarceration differently, and those differences have always influenced my thinking and my work as I have moved from rural western PA where I'm from to Pittsburgh, New York City, Ithaca, and now Boston. I would be especially excited to learn from members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and to think more deeply about the policing and incarceration of indigenous people within the borders of what is now called New York State. Thank you for your time and consideration, and again, I look forward to speaking with you next week.